Good morning to all. Uh, it's uh, it's quite a, a wet morning. Apparently, uh, there's uh, in Vancouver going to be a bit more dry weather this afternoon. I look forward to it. I wanted to welcome you all to the UBC Learning Circle. I uh, firstly wanted to respectfully acknowledge that we, the UBC Learning Circle, is located on the traditional ancestral unceded territory of the Musqueam people. UBCLC is generously funded by the First Nations Health Authority and is based out of the Center for Excellence in Indigenous Health which is part of the UBC Faculty of Medicine. Our programming highlights indigenous knowledge sharing among health professionals, community members, elders, students, and youth. We offer workshops on indigenous physical, mental, spiritual, and emotional health and wellness. I am Aurelia Kinslow. I am the Education Coordinator for the UBC Learning Circle. I'm very happy to be here today. Uh, I am also a PhD candidate in the Faculty of Education, and my ancestry is Cherokee Choctaw, African American, and Scandinavian. I'm very pleased to welcome Dee. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Dee Parsanishi, uh, uh, for being here today with us. Uh, Dee is an SE Trauma Institute faculty member, and in this session, she will be addressing ways to heal trauma, both with First Nations and non-First Nations people. In her work, Dee has pondered uh, on what helps people, families, and communities to survive. This conversation will explore ideas of attachment, interdependence, and culture, and their relationship to healing trauma. It will also include some cross-cultural concepts that have come from Dee's own exploration of her lost and becoming found Japanese cultural background. Welcome, Dee. Thank you. Good morning, good morning. Um, I'd just like to acknowledge that I'm here in Port Alberni on Kukusiset and Sashok traditional territory this morning. So we're in multiple places and then there's people all over BC joining us. So good morning. Good morning. Um, uh, really, would you be willing to put up the PowerPoint? Yeah, I will put it PowerPoint up right away. Well? Awesome. So, um, I met, might have met some of you before on previous conversations. It feels very strange to me not to be able to see your faces or to be able to uh, <laughs> hear your voices, but I know we're going to have some help with uh, questions as they come up on the chat, so please feel free, either in the chat or in the question and answer, there's a couple of places where you can read that, and um, just make sure that the Learning Circle and or Divina are included in that conversation, they're going to be watching the, the questions that come in. Right. So, Give so me I'm one moment. Go ahead. Yeah. Yep, go ahead. No problem. Uh, I work in, in Port Alberni. I work, I teach, um, I'm starting to teach a little more around the world. I'm going to be in White Horse next week, which is exciting. I don't know if we have anybody on the conversation from White Horse. And um, in the introduction, earlier was talking about the fact that I'm Connecting back to some of my Japanese culture. I've been um, invited in, in July, I'll be heading back to Japan, or to Japan for the first time for me, and half Japanese. And I will be heading to Japan to teach some of the trauma work in Japan, and it has gotten me exploring um, this part of my own cultural history. And so we're going to have a little bit of a conversation at the end about some of the things I'm learning about uh, Japanese culture and how they fit with my own experience, both as a, as a trauma therapist, but also as a family member in a Japanese family. Excellent. Um, so, yeah, I really have you got the PowerPoint still coming? I'm having a little bit of a s slow load on this, and I'm trying something different so that I can uh, load it differently. No, no problem. I just want to make sure I'm not missing it and everyone else is seeing it. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, sorry, sorry about the technical so difficulties today. So, one of the things that, that was already the Learning Circle mentions it, and I'm going to mention it again. That's okay is um, that sometimes the information that we're talking about in the uh, setting and touch stuff in our own selves and get things moving emotionally 
or physically. Sometimes people will feel sad or overwhelmed or angry. Sometimes people will feel numb or like too much energy in the system. Like all of a sudden they just get tired and sleepy. And so what I would invite you to do is just try not like that. And if you notice something that seems kind of surprising, you know, you're all of a sudden getting upset or you have a bunch of energy or getting tired and want to just close your eyes and have a nap, just to know that that might be a physical response, an emotional response to what we're talking about. And feel free to go for a little walk, feel free to, you know, go and connect with someone. Uh, there was the, the number to the... The crisis line posted up earlier. Make connections. You can go if you happen to be at home. You can go and snuggle with one of your pets. <laughs> but just please take care of yourselves. Yeah. Thank you for that, Dee. All right. So I am now working on memory of what is on my first slide. <laughs> and I'm sure um, what I really want to talk about is I want to talk about attachment and how we connect to uh, the first first people who meet us in school. Mm -hmm. We're making connections when we're in our mama's belly, we're making connections when we're uh, held and breastfed, we're breastfed, when we're bottle fed, if we're bottle fed, we're making connections when uh, family and friends make funny little faces at us. And this connection is not just a emotional connection. It is certainly an emotional connection. But it also has um, a physiological effect. It actually helps to wire the brain. And this may be sort of common information for many of you. Um, attachment is kind of all the very interesting. But that, the quality and quantity of really the quality of the relationship that we have with those first caregivers, if they're really able to help us feel safe and secure, um, build wires actually uh, a part of the brain uh, that helps us learn how to settle <coughs> ourselves. So when we're born, um, as a baby, we, we all actually can know this. Babies don't have the capacity to really settle themselves. If a uh, baby's sleeping and I walk in and slam the door and say, I just had an argument with my partner, walk into the big screen and lets me know that they won't look up suddenly and they're scared. If I walk over to the baby, and pick baby up and, and I think this is important that I go and I pick baby up. I don't stand across the room for baby and say, hey sweetie, everything's fine. <laughs> that was just me slamming the door. It was a big loud noise, but you're okay. We know that baby won't settle if I talk to baby when he it. Instead, I go over and pick baby up and if I'm settled, then baby will feel that settling and start to settle down. Baby requires a, an external nervous system, an external human being to provide this safe and secure part of the nervous system for it to feel safe. Baby will first scream, go into what we call sympathetic or fight or flight, <laughs> right? Slam the door, ah! we get all this energy in the system. And if I come over and I'm supportive and I pick up baby and I'm settled and baby is able to settle with yeah, I'm still kind of frustrated with my partner because we just had this big fight and I'm <coughs> up in my sympathetic system. I'm still in a bit of fight because I'm angry or I'm a little bit anxious. Then when I hold baby, we know that baby won't settle. Baby keeps crying. Baby keeps up in that sympathetic fight or flight because it doesn't have the capacity to feel safe. And so I 
be shaking baby and trying to get baby settled. And then I go, oh, right. <laughs> baby won't settle as long as I'm upset. Or maybe if I'm lucky, my parent comes in, my father comes in the room and says, you know, you go get settled, I'm going to take baby. And my father takes baby and he settles. He settles and that will allow baby to feel safe and secure. And every time that happens, that baby gets upset and someone comes in and is able to help baby settle, that wires in this part of the brain that wasn't developed when the baby. It develops really intensely for the first week and a half. It continues to develop right up into, um, you know, into the tip early twenties. Babies don't have that capacity to feel safe and secure. Them. So here's another good scenario. I wasn't able to settle, but my father came in, was happy to be there. He settles baby, and baby gets this feeling of being safe in the world, but also gets this support in wiring baby's brain. So now it has a little more capacity, a little more capacity. This is the ideal situation. But sometimes it might be that I'm the only one to And it may be it wasn't just a little fight with my partner. But maybe something is really not okay. Maybe I'm living in a situation where things aren't safe. And I come in and I try and support me. And my system isn't making it safe and secure and safe. I don't have the sense of being safe and secure. <clears throat> and so I'm trying to do that for me. But it doesn't work. And so baby will keep crying and crying and crying until there's another part of the nervous system that takes over called the dorsal vagal parasympathetic. The name doesn't really matter. But basically, it's the shutdown or the freeze thing. And it takes over. And it allows the baby to stop spending all that energy and allows the baby to, to come into the less spending, less energy, but really not in a safe place. It's more, I give up. Nobody's going to help. All right, so I see we've got the. Um, We've got the PowerPoint here, so I'm going to skip a little bit through. Okay. Yay, by the way. <laughs> Thank you for your patience on that. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> That's how wonderful a presenter you are. You didn't even need your two, three slides. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we'll see how much I mucked it up. <laughs> Let's try it. <laughs> I was captivated. I'll come back to this one. <laughs> <laughs> so this slide is slide four, and it's talking about, we'll do a little review, that we're talking about these two initial survival responses that the baby has, the screaming and the crying or the shutdown and freeze, and that's where we just got to. If we can, if, if I don't have, either right in this moment because some, I just got some really bad news, or the situation I'm living in is really scary. If I don't have that safe and secure accessible, baby will scream until it can basically realizes on a nervous system level, the, the nervous system says this isn't working. I'm going to shut down because that will, then I won't spend so much energy. And babies, they don't have a lot of fat, they don't have a lot of resources. So they do that. Um, that's a really important survival strategy. So that they don't just scream themselves till they burn up all their blood sugar and they don't have a heart attack. They instead go into the shutdown state. And that's a way of having less energy. So, uh, the most important point here is that we require help, the help of a safe and secure adult, to be able as a baby to truly settle down and feel safe. And this is true um, as children, as we get older, as teenagers, 
And it's actually true as atoms. It's less true because if everything went well and we got lots of support for the safe and secure caregivers, we've wired in this system into our brain so that when we get upset, we can come down and say, but it's always nice to have a friend, <laughs> a loved one, a family. And we're going to talk more about that later. Okay, so this is just the example that we're talking about, that we have to go over when the baby gets startled. We have to go over and make contact. And that the experience of a baby feeling more simple in contact with an adult is actually what helps to develop the pathways in the baby's brain that will help them to be able to settle on their own as they mature. Mm -hmm. Indeed. This is one of the most, um, I think this is the most important piece, because the next slide says a little bit more about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think that I, I'm really fascinated by this concept that uh, oh. an outside nervous system is is supporting a child in in uh, in settling down. Uh, I, I really like this idea. I I, I myself have a, a small child and, and haven't haven't thought of it that way. That my nervous system is helping regulate hers. Yeah, and it's helping her now. Yeah. Because it's also helping her when she gets older. Yeah. Because she's developing this um a message from someone who said they still can't hear anything. Yeah. Let's see. Let me let me send a message to everyone. So I'll really I'll let you troubleshoot that uh -huh. one and I'll keep going. Okay. Because it sounds like we've got some people hearing things. Yeah, that's what I think, yeah. Okay. So this is the piece that is so important, and I'm going to read this piece, and, and it's, you know, repetition, but we, safe and settled adults, parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, brothers, sisters, caregivers at daycare, at school, we provide the template for babies and children's brains to develop the capacity to feel safe and secure in the world. We are that template. Oh, we got another person who cannot hear. Um, I'm gargling. <laughs> yeah, the the connection isn't very good. Um, I wonder if things slow down. That's that's yeah, it's a bit slow, but all of a sudden. I'm yeah, I'm hearing you very well on this end. Just wondering if if more people could respond to let us know. Uh, Here. Yeah, yeah. I think there's it's a mixed bag here. Sound is a bit broken. I'll just garble. All good for me, says Jade. I think it's, it's a mix. Hmm. Okay. I'm curious how far back that that went. That people that things are garbled. Can't hear anything. I'm sorry, everyone's having so much trouble. A few people, not everyone, but. Okay, so I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep going with the slide, and, and you'll see the slides as we go, and you'll be able to come back and have a look. Right. The other thing is, if it's working good for you, Aurelia, then the the um, recording. That's right. Should be good. So if there's pieces you miss, you should be able to fast forward. Exactly. Catch up. Sorry. Yeah. So, when you enjoy that wonderful snuggle with the baby, the cuddle, or a little one, um, it's kind of, I think it's kind of sweet to know that not only am I enjoying this cuddle, but that I'm also investing in this child's long term capacity to feel safer. That this is going to be a payoff down the line for them to be able to settle themselves as an adult. Leave the stress. If 
people also um, instill in them a basic belief that, that it's safe to go to other towards other human beings for support. So, yeah, we have the basic belief. If I get sort of good enough people around me who are safe and help me settle, then I have a basic belief that if I need help, people will help me. This is a really good thing. And then I have the capacity to settle myself after being startled or distressed. And, and I think one of the best places that, that I like to see this is in kids when they go for their first sleep home. Is that this is a distressing thing. It's also an exciting thing. It's a wonderful thing to have a sleep home where it's on house. It certainly is around my house. They, they, they love it. Um, but so if we have a, a well-developed, safe and secure part of the nervous system, then when kids get six, seven, eight, nine, ten, they start to feel capable of settling themselves when they get distressed, when they get homesick. And very often what they can do then is phone us or cuddle a stuff we need or talk to another safe and secure adult who's in the house. And then again, with a little support, they're able to use that safe and secure part of the nervous system and settle and go to sleep. Sometimes it might take a couple of rocks. It might take a couple of times of bringing the kid home and letting them know they can come back to us and feel safe. It might take a couple of phone calls to get them settled. It might even take a little visit to come and tuck them in and you know, let them, and when they're asleep, then they're settled. But this is all the evidence of this developing nervous system, this developing capacity in the child. And they, this is such a rewarding thing because they get to play and they get to feel capable and confident. And so that's a lovely place where we can really be supporting children to be safe and secure as they entertain this idea of having sleepovers. And why we want to be really careful to make sure that they feel safe and secure. That we give them the support so that they don't end up going to sleep, trying to sleep when they're really in fight or flight, or having to shut down and be kind of hopeless that nobody's going to help. And that's the way they get to sleep. So we can really attune with them. This is the same thing that I actually think it's So, this also means that with this body belief that the world is a safe place and they are loved, that even when scary things happen, and scary things always happen, that's part of life, they have the capacity to reconnect with a safe person in the world, with themselves, and come back to feeling safe. So we see this kind of capacity to, be, to come back to feeling safe, not having to live up in that high private or flight, or not having to live in that kind of shut down. And very often people will describe that as feeling depressed, very depressed, low energy, not having any energy to do life, to make life happen. Or very often it's also kind of oscillating between for someone who's older who doesn't have this safe, secure system. It's oscillating between really high fight or flight states, anxiety or anger, and really low states of influence. So here is the good news about cuddling with babies. So here's where we were now. We were talking about what if you didn't or couldn't go over and pick up it. So babies crying and um, I bet they can't tell you how to turn the volume on. <laughs> so baby's crying and I'm not there. 
for whatever reason, I'm unavailable, and I don't come over and help baby. Again, this is the same thing as when I go over to baby and I'm not taking this out, then baby has to at some point turn on that freeze response. Baby has to turn on that freeze response so that they don't just keep whining and essentially go up and up and up until they give themselves a heart attack or burn all their energy. At some point, their instinct will turn on that freeze response to say we've got to conserve some energy so that we can survive. And again, if I don't show up, this sets up a really early belief that nobody will help us. So there's both this and the belief system, but also now um, the lack of developing the safe and secure pathway and much more use of scared and angry, sympathetic, or much more use of that dorsal response, that shutdown, that previous response. So if there are enough of those moments when no one is there to help the baby settle, those beliefs can become incredibly strong, that no one will help us. And the brain pathways for feeling safe and secure are highly underdeveloped. So they actually, as, as they grow, are unable to do that function. They cannot safe, settle themselves. We got any questions so far? Not so far. We're more more uh, right. volume and whatnot. <laughs> <laughs> more technical problems. Yeah. All right. We're, we're addressing we're addressing these one by one. Try try to address it so each case by case. Mm -hmm. Here's the other one that we already. Very good. Okay. 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 So here's the other example we talked about when I don't feel safe, baby screaming, I come over and hold baby. Again, baby's going to stay up in that sympathetic and that fight of me until it can't, well, the, the nervous system can't support that anymore and it's going to go into freeze. And again, we don't get the development of these safe and secure pathways. Okay, I see something that I want to. Someone says, Kyle says, this just happens to sound a lot like kids in care. Absolutely. Does this mean there's no means of mitigating the early impacts of this freezing mechanism? No. It doesn't mean that. This is a good thing. And this is why, um, why we're talking about it, is there are impacts, but it doesn't mean that there's nothing we can do. Um, what it means is the more experiences a child can have at any age, this I do this work with adults. So there's not a point where you can't do it. Um, any experiences that we have of being safe and secure, having people who are safe and secure and have that part of their nervous system available and being able to access it. Now, this is sometimes the tricky part. It's really hard if I don't believe that people are, are going to be helpful. And that's not a cognitive belief. It's an instinctual belief. It's sort of like um, our response to snakes, right? Not many of us are, um, can, I'm going to try and get the video back. Not many of us can see a snake and not have at least initially a little response like this. A little like it's, it's an instinctual response because we don't want to get bitten by a snake. If I have had the experience over and over as a child that people are unsafe, I'm going to have initially that first response. And we need to do some work to start to what we call uncouple the fear from the human contact. We need to be able to kind of break up that initial learning. This is just normal learning, right? If I touch a, 
the burner on the stove and I get burnt, I don't do that again. <laughs> um, this is what happens when the people are people aren't safe and secure that people can go to to be to feel safe and secure. So um, we can certainly do work. And what we need to know is that every one of those cuddles, every one of those connections at school, every one of those interactions with our nieces, our nephews, uh oh. Family counselors, any of our contact with children and adults who don't have a well developed, safe, and secure pathway, every one of our interactions where they get the experience of being in relationship with us and feeling a little bit more secure, a little bit more safe, and starting to settle, that is helping. Why are those neural pathways? It's not always easy, depending on how long a child has been in care and how many difficult things happen in care or not in care. Um, it's more work, but we just persist and we keep doing, doing our best to be a safe person. And this is where sometimes some work, some um, a referral to a good trauma therapist is helpful because they can start to actually uncouple those really work in a very directed way to uncouple the fear from the coming into connection. And when that happens, then the person can start to come towards other people more easily without so much anxiety and can actually benefit from all the loving people who are hanging around. That's one of the things that happens when, um, when it's so scary to come, to make connections with people, is there could be all these lovely people around me who are going to you know, want to help me wire my brain. But if I'm afraid of them, it's really hard for me to make, to make use of what they're offering. So um, doing some good work with the trauma therapist who has a little bit of a, uh, has some training around attachment can really help to uncouple that fear from that desire to connect. I hope that's helpful. Bye. <clears throat> so, so Dee, there are a couple of uh, follow-up comments uh, to that. There we go. One was yeah. about uh, um, different different forms of um, attachment. One person said disorganized attachment. And um, right. you know, talking about uh, you know, the type, different kinds of attachment styles that could develop in a baby. As Absolutely. A, yeah. So that's a bigger conversation mm -hmm. um, than today. Certainly the more, there's tons of really great information on what happens because sometimes babies will um, will want to approach, um, but also be scared. And so there'll be this kind of anxious moving forward with it backwards. Sometimes there's, I just don't believe in doing the attachment thing anymore, right? Mm -hmm. I'm just going to stay away from people because they're all really scary and my experience is something bad enough. Um, sometimes there's the, um, There's, there's also the sort of, I always need to get, I always need it because I never get enough. I always need attachment and that's, that's a little bit more. So that's a big anxious. The disorganized is when people come towards, it's, 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 it's a real bond because I need it and I want it and sometimes I got it. But sometimes I didn't and I got hurt. I got hit, I got injured. I got yelled at, and so there is both this, I want to move towards it, but every time that I move towards it, I get really scared. And so this is, um, this is tricky, and certainly, uh, you know, future uh, education for people who are really interested in that. But the, I think today, the really important thing is to understand that if we can help people have experiences where they're around other human beings, 
and start to feel a little bit more safe, if, particularly if we can do that with children, but all the way up to their 60s, 70s, and 80s. <laughs> if we can do that, we are able to make changes in the way that the brain is wired. So they get um, what from the attachment place. So they talk about secure attachment being sort of, I, I'm good enough. I have that safe and secure part of my nervous system. And so even if I didn't maybe get it when I was a kid, if I have enough experiences and I do enough work, I then get an earned secure. So I used to be really afraid of going to people for help, and I had trouble settling myself. I just hide out crying in my bedroom. But as I did work, as I had more loving people around me, I married into this really loving family, and they provided all these experiences for me of feeling safe. It took a while, but after a while, I started coming out of my bedroom instead of running away. And I would tell them I wasn't feeling safe, and they would help me settle. Now, over time, I have an earned secure. I have earned it as an adult. It wasn't gifted to me as a child. Oh, that's really powerful, actually. <laughs> So, yeah, maybe it is, isn't it? It's pretty cool. So, I want to speak a little bit about how these dynamics are passed through the generation. Because I, I think there's a place for this to sound really blank and really shaming parents for not being able to do, give a child what they need. But it's important. And, and shaming on us for not being able to manage our own uh, emotional states, not being able to settle down. So, first thing, we need to understand that this different brain development, the lack of this safe and secure brain, brain pathways, is a natural and normal result of us not getting what we need and deserve as a baby or as a child. It's not that I wasn't good enough. It wasn't not that I wasn't smart enough. It's that I didn't get what I needed to wire in those brain pathways. I would never shame myself for not being able to ride, or most people do, for not being able to ride a bike if I'd never been put on a bike. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. We know that if I've never been on a bike before, I'm not going to know how to ride a bike. We need to be provided the opportunity Foster, to learn how to ride a bike. The same thing is true with developing a safe and secure nervous system. We need to be provided the opportunities to develop that nervous system if we're going to be able to do it. So it's important not to kind of shame ourselves for not having or shame the people who we work with or the people who we love for not being able to do it. And very often, the reason that we didn't get it is that our parents and our grandparents didn't get it either. So it's not that they don't want to give that to us. It's very often that their own trauma history and their own attachment lacks. Their own, they didn't have the opportunity to build that strong system, there weren't enough moments of being with a safe and secure adult, that they didn't learn how to do it. They didn't wire it in. And so then when they go and try, and they do, they want to offer it to us, and, and I might be busy there, you know, jingling my baby, going, I'm really trying to settle them, but I'm so, I'm so active, I'm so much in my sympathetic that baby feels it. And this is, this is again, where grandparents can be wonderful, because by very often we develop this a little bit more over time. So even if, say, my father wasn't able to offer it to me, and that's part of why, or, um, you know, he, he went through certain events that made it difficult at that time of life to offer it to me. As this older adult, he may now have figured it out. So he comes in because he has, um, so we talk about this as a neural platform. 
he has the wiring at that point in his brain and the capacity to do it. So he can offer. And so this is, I, I think this is part of it takes a village to raise a child. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because at any moment, if, um, if I just lost someone who I love, it's going to be much harder for me to, even if I've got pretty good safe and secure pathways, it's going to be a lot harder for me to access them. If I'm having, um, you will see this often with babies, there might be um, a baby born and mom has to have surgery. And so she's actually not that available for me. Baby's out asking for this. But mom would have loved to have been there. She might be, in fact, in fact quite anxious and not, about not being there. But because she has to undergo surgery, she's under anesthesia, she's healing, she's not fully able to come into that part of her system. Maybe dad's doing his best and he's available sometimes, but he's got three more kids at home that he has to make sure they're fed and clothed and make some money. And, and so we see very often it isn't, it, it isn't an intention to not be able to provide those opportunities. When we look at, um, or it isn't the parent's intention. When we look at residential school, Use another place where that got taken away. And those pathways, those safe and secure pathways, were completely messed up for many children in residential school because there were no safe and secure adults to go to. The adults were, in fact, dangerous. And they may have been. Kids may have even had siblings who they could have gone to for that, but they weren't allowed to connect with their siblings. So there were all these places where this disrupted attachment to whole. And then you have the, the children growing up who didn't get enough of those siblings. They may have, some of them may have gotten them in the first five years before they headed off to residential school. And those kids actually did very often were doing better than some of the kids who didn't have those really safe and secure experiences prior to residential school. But they go to parent, and if they don't know how the nervous system, they don't know how to do it. And so then we see this kind of pass through the generations. Again, everybody's trying, all the family members are trying to do their best. Certainly, Canada was not trying to do its best. But absolutely, the family members were trying to do their best. But again, they didn't get that wiring in the system, so it's very hard. Got any new questions after that? No, nope, not at the moment, but uh, we welcome qu your questions. If at any point you have any, please feel free to put them in the chat box. So, what does this mean when we get older? What does this lack of a safe and secure system? We talked earlier about what a, a safe and, having a safe and secure system looks like as we get older. Now we're going to talk about not having a safe and secure system. So, without strong, safe, and secure brain pathways, we have trouble settling down when we get startled or scared or angry. This is just a fact. If I don't have this nice, safe, and secure brain system to kind of slow things down. So we may experience very intense emotional outbursts that may be larger and must, much less controllable than those of the people around us. In my work site, why is it that I'm the one who keeps losing it when other people don't? Or why is it that I keep losing my job because I, you know, get really upset and have to leave work? This is a neurological problem. <laughs> this is not a bad human being problem. This is a problem of the fact that I never got the exposure to the safe and secure pathways that I needed. This is the fact that nobody ever taught me to ride a bike. <laughs> All right, 
and we may be dependent on others to settle. This is another thing that can be really frustrating. And if there are no people to help us, we then may use drugs or alcohol or sex or food or gambling to help us feel safe. That then becomes the sort of external nervous system in a way. It's not really a nervous system, but it's the external tool that helps us do the thing that we can do, that everybody else appears to do. Okay, I got another question. Yeah, we have one question here. Um, do you want me to read it out for you? Sure, that'd be great. So uh, Kyle says, uh, hello, I guess another question I have is how the reaction works. I've seen kids and adults fine while in survival mode, and then once secure, a lot of mental health concerns like PTSD and abandonment experiences surface. Are those experiences part of the trauma we're talking about today? Yes, I'm going to actually have to look at that question because that's a lot for me to <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Can you so this is a really great description is that that when we're in when we're experiencing the threat that we hold it together and we have to that's what um that's what very often what that freeze response does um and we'll, we'll see this very often with um with children in school is while things are really difficult, they're kind of shut down and depressed, but they're a bit invisible because they're not creating a problem. And then we see a child get into a safe place, things stabilize after the divorce or after they're settled into a long-term foster care placement or after their parent um, gets into treatment or after um, the, the parent's mental health issues get get stabilized. And all of a sudden, now they're a problem. Now they're acting out, now they're upset, now they're stealing stuff. And it's it's actually, um, in a weird way, it's very often that they're moving out of that freeze response and they're moving up into more of that sympathetic. And it's messier there. But it's part of what we have to do to get over very often into the more safe and secure. And so they need to be kind of like the crime being and have human beings around them. We don't yell at them, shame them, make them feel bad and force them back down into the shutdown. But who have boundaries, for sure, but who also understand the process that's going on so that then they can come down. Um, use that person's settled nervous system to start to wire in these new patterns. And so, yeah, there is this really odd thing where very often when people come out of that more shutdown state, it's actually looks good. We're on our way to the right place if we can just get the right support, those good, safe, and secure um, nervous systems around that, around them. But um, it does look messier. Part of our job is to tolerate, right? Um, uh, babies who have um, trauma, prenatal trauma or birth trauma, are often described as very good babies because all they do is they can sleep because they're in those real dorsal states. So they don't very often come up into the screaming crying, but that's actually a bit of a flag. It's not always a thing, but it's a good thing to notice if the baby doesn't, isn't moving up into a good cry every once in a while and saying there's a problem, then you might have, there's a possibility to have a baby who very early on had to use that dorsal system either before they were born or during their, their birth process. And we want to do a little bit of support. We're actually looking for when the baby starts to cry and scream. That's a really juicy, wonderful place. It's not always fun for the parents because now they're <laughs> dealing with the crying baby and getting less sleep. But in terms of the baby's health over time, it's a really important stage. And that then the parent is able to work at how they figure out how they're going to help settle baby for the facts. All right. So 
what does this mean if we don't have this stable system, stable, safe, and secure system? It means that we may have a general sense that the world is unsafe and that no one is there to help us. This may mean that even if there are people who are there to help us, we don't feel safe enough to connect. We talked about that earlier. And again, we may end up using drugs or alcohol or sex or food or gambling to take the place of the safe and secure medical system and help us manage the intensity of what it's like to be up here or the numbness of what it's like to be in that freeze resource. Okay, so here's the cool thing. As I've been um, learning more about Japan and about my own Japanese background, I was given a book um, about this word ame. And it's quite fascinating. It's a Japanese concept, a Japanese word. And um, it's the wish and the desire to be loved totally in our tradition. It is the feeling, that first feeling of the attachment, the good, healthy attachment that happens when we're close to our caregivers and say, It's the feeling that happens when the baby screams and we come over and we settle them, and that's happening. And from a Japanese perspective, they expect to have that feeling through the whole lifespan. I think this is really interesting. So it's the feeling of pleasure and yumminess that one gets from being dependent on another person. And it is the behavior that we do and that they then do back to us that demonstrates this kind of dependent relationship. So one example with a child is when a child pretends that they can't tie their shoes and the parent indulges them and ties their shoes. <laughs> In our culture, we have, in Western culture, we have a real preference. This is Western culture because I think it's very different in many First Nations cultures. In so of Western culture, we have a preference for if a child can tie their shoes, they should tie their shoes. We have a real strong value on independence. This is different in Japan. We also see this in adults. And it happens when one adult indul indulges the childlike or dependent behavior of another adult. So this is an adult-to-adult -adult relationship. So an example might be when one adult acts as if they can't carry the books, and another adult who knows that they can <laughs> chooses to carry the books for it is so bad. When I heard that, I'm like, I know that in me. I know that place. There's that place where I'm sick, and I can make my suit. It's not that hard for me to make my suit, but I want somebody to make my suit for me. And when someone will make my suit for me, I feel this delicious quality of anime. It makes me feel loved. And I'm actually, it's so funny to notice that right now I'm getting a little teary yeah. as I name that. <laughs> Same here, I'm like, yeah, that's so endearing. <laughs> but, but I think it's because very often in our culture, um, that's seen as a negative thing. That's seen as me not being independent, of me acting as a child of me not being respectful of the person who I'm asking to make my suit. And what I love about this, this concept 
about this word is that in Japanese culture, this is something that is expected. It's expected that we will have any relationships with people on either side, either as the person who needs the indulging or as the person who does the indulging, that we will have those throughout our life. And I suspect, I think, that that addresses this neurological thing that we were talking about earlier. I suspect that if we can see that as a positive instead of as a negative in someone, the, word, the way I put it, someone, I don't know if it's amaze towards us or amaru towards us, I'm going to have to check that out, which the verb is. But when someone amorous, so let's say amaze towards us, that I think if I respond right, then that is where those attachment bonds, where the brain in the nervous, the brain in the nervous system rewires, and that we don't have to think of it as inappropriate when someone acts in this slightly more childlike way. I suspect that is the attempt to kind of consolidate the safe and secure nervous system. And to me, maybe other people this is like, well, of course. <laughs> but to me, this was a really big thing for me to understand my own need for Anne as an adult instead of always expecting myself to be well not. So, from a Japanese perspective, ame is a healthy feeling for both children and adults to have. And they recognize that people's mental health is negatively impacted if they cannot ame, if they cannot experience this quality of dependence on another person. That that would be, um, again, a lack of some kind of experience that makes a healthy adult. Now, again, I thought that's interesting. We've started to acknowledge that you know people will um, not do well if they don't get touched. There's way more research now that if adults don't get any touch, then their mental health will be impacted. I like the fact that we can talk about amity and being indulged in this slightly more childlike way is also part of the big mental health thing. And this is such a different belief than the Western focus on independence and the negative con concept of codependence. Mm -hmm. This is a real kind of looking at this idea of codependence from a different place. Um, is that a question? Yeah. The, in, in, a, in addition to, to this idea of like dependence, I, the word that's coming up for me is nurturance. And, and just, uh, I, I was just wondering to myself, how, how would I have described this before today? And it's like this need for mutual nurturance between two people. And uh, I, yeah, I, I wonder how does, how, did, how does that concept kind of fit into that picture, do you think? I don't know if I have the answer for this yet. For me, this is just, this is like really new. This is really mm. fresh for me. Mm. And so I'm excited to talk about it, but I haven't, I haven't, I haven't got answers yet. So I, that, I mean, that's part of why I'm really interested in what this brings up. But I think your connection to nurturance. Yeah, yeah. 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 And sometimes nurturance gets a bit of a bad rap. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it doesn't. You know, there's a lot about self care. Maybe right. that's a connection, right? right. It's like self care. Well, why does it have to be self care? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but why? Where's the place where I can also be cared for? by others, mm -hmm. and where we recognize that, and it can't always be one person getting, receiving all of it, that would be healthy, mm -hmm. but is there a way, I like the word reciprocity, and, and sometimes it might be, um, I'm doing a lot of receiving from certain people in my life, but I do my giving elsewhere, mm -hmm. sometimes it might be reciprocity back and forth in certain relationships, mm -hmm. but that what I like about this term is it recognizes through the lifespan that we need 
attachment, we need food into our hearts, into our spirits, into our nervous system wiring. We need those experiences to be a healthy human being. Mm -hmm. And I, I think there's a lot from a, you know, I come from a Western psychological perspective, and I think there's a lot to be offered with that. Mm -hmm. that yeah. Yeah, thanks for sharing it. I think it's a really beautiful one and, and wonderful to think about how to build up, build upon. And well, and I think it's been one of the challenges for people trained in a Western perspective. In, in fact, the book, um, the citation is, I think it's next. I think it's in the next slide. Um, the, the man's name is Takeo Doi, and he talks. He, came and studied psychiatry in the U.S. from Japan, and then he went back and he's like, why, is it, why doesn't this make any sense? There's some stuff that just doesn't fit. Mm -hmm. And he couldn't um, really understand this fierce importance of independ independence. Right. And even the concept, he said, the, the concept of freedom hasn't really taken hold, or at that point anyways, hasn't really taken hold in Japan because of the collaborative and collectivist culture mm -hmm. of I don't see myself as just me. I also experience myself as my community, mm -hmm. as my family. And, and there's, again, lots of more definitions of how the Japanese sort of see close, close people who are close to them. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a huge conversation. And Kyle, you have a story. Is there a way we can turn on Kyle's mic? Oh, let's see. Have a mic? Because Kyle has Let me see if I can figure that out. out. Okay, Kyle, while we're trying to do that, I'm just going to keep moving forward. And I'm going to tell a little story. But we'll pause when we can and we'll get you to share. Yes, I can unmute not, Kyle. Here. Kyle, okay, can you? Okay. Can you speak, Kyle? Say there something? It is. Test it. Hi. We just want to uh, maybe turn up your volume internally in your computer a little bit and, and or get closer to the mic. How's it? Perfect. Thank you. Uh, so, I guess my question was that I can just speak to my own personal experience as a First Nations man who grew up on reserve. So we talk about trauma and generations that we passed down. Like my dad actually was a survivor of residential school. Um, my family just carries tons of maladaptive behavior, I guess, where there is no, you know, but self-soothing or carrying it. But the healthy members, they taught me how to lean on other families. So the, it was weird when I moved away from the res and moved into a city where I had to learn to be dependent. I guess when you talk about um, I mean, yeah. it really struck home in the sense of like, oh my goodness, this is exactly what I've been dealing with the last couple of years with one of my close friends. Because we come from a white background and I made it, it's just, it's just an extraordinary experience. So I guess my question was like, do um, you think you'd be able to find similar examples of Abe in person culture in Canada? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and the interesting thing that that Takeo Doi was talking about is he says Abe happens everywhere. It's just that there's no word for it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he said we all do it. It's just that we don't necessarily value it yeah. or remark upon it. Acknowledge it. Mm -hmm. That's right. And so that to me was the wonderful thing about discovering this word and this whole conversation is that's right. I might, have, and, and, and this is this is one of my things. Is I would often see what I think now is AMA behavior, and because of my Western psychological background, I would see it as a bad thing. Mm -hmm. So he, here's the story. It's okay, and, and Kyle, talk again after the story. If Thank you, Kyle. Comments <laughs> and questions. Okay. So I, my dad is Japanese, and my mother is white. And we have um, a, a side of the family that is more, what I would say, is more Japanese 
than my side of the bed. So um, I have two aunts uh, who are quite Japanese. They speak the language regularly. They're my great aunts, actually. But their kids spoke the language. They grew up around the language. They grew up more, way more in the culture. And um, my one aunt was really frustrated for my family because she would get upset and over something that didn't seem like much to anybody else. But she'd get real mad and then she'd not talk to people. And it was what, what we thought of as very childlike behavior. So she would not talk to people and sort of cut people out for a little while. And my Japanese part of the family would indulge her, would ame her. They would stop by and drop things off. They would make phone calls. And even if she was rude, they would keep making these connections. And my side of the map that I think of as sort of less understanding the Japanese culture, we just went to heck with it. If she doesn't want to talk to us, we won't talk to her. Right? And, and it was much more this idea of disconnecting. And I thought, well, that's the right, that's the way I should, that's the way our family should be. But when I, when I thought about this idea of Abby, what it made me think is, was she trying to make a connection with us? Was that actually not an attempt to push us away, but an attempt for us to come forward and say, you matter to us, we care about you, we want you in our life. And that was a really, I mean, that's a sad thought for me, that if that was the message she was sending and I didn't get it, that's, that's, that's really sad. Mm -hmm. And so for me, thinking about um, these behaviors that I would traditionally say are, you know, childlike or inappropriate or not okay, if I look at them from this anime perspective, it gives me another, another way to hold the baby. And what happens if I instead come forward and say, yeah, we're sharing some tears, are we? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, what if instead I could see that as an attempt to connect? That is such a different thing to me. And then I can hold that behavior in a really different way. Mm -hmm. And I I suspect that psychotherapy, um, Western psychotherapy in general, could really benefit from some of that. And maybe just Western sure. whatever yeah. could benefit. Philosophy, from. ways of thinking and being in That's general. Right. Yeah. That's right. And, and I suspect that that's been at play in my what I appreciated, but also what I haven't understood in working in First Nations communities with First Nations people, is that I think that there's a lot more anime at play than I knew. And that those that, that people may have been sending out requests that I wasn't getting. And that's concerning for me and the place that now that I then get to work differently that I can understand that as a request for them. In the example you gave earlier with, with your aunt, or, or any other example, have, have you noticed uh, um, someone who has been lavished with ame and, and, and been giving, given these tokens of love and, and uh, indulged and seen a, a difference in, in how they respond to the people around them over time, like in this particular case or another? In that one, she died before I got the... Got the message. <laughs> um, so th I don't have a chance to do that on the way. But it's funny because it's certainly, I think, in the work that I do in my office around attachment, I think that I have that awareness, or I think I've developed that awareness, that I expect, um, in a way, younger 
younger experiences of self show up. And I recognize that when they do, I need to respond not to the 40-year-old who, you know, is in the room, but I might need to respond in a way that makes sense to quiet. And so in my office, I was kind of, kind of get it. But I think there was this whole other place where I missed it. And it's like in the rest of the world. <laughs> and it's like, well, why wouldn't it be true? Why wouldn't people be doing the same thing out in the world? And what if that's okay? It doesn't mean I always have to be willing to respond to MA back. Mm -hmm. But if I see it as an invitation, then I can decide. Do I want to respond? And, and I have to say this for me, the independence thing is going to be a tough one. Yeah. Because I've been well indoctrinated in this idea of being. Right. But um, I think it's a worthy discussion for us. Yeah. Because I think it has a direct, I think it has a direct impact on this wiring in our work. Mm -hmm. And on this opportunity for us to support the development of people's safety and secure nervous system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And just to just maintain it over time. Because my system is, you know, good enough. It's not perfect. But I have a, a sort of good enough um, safe and secure system. It's been challenged, and, but, you know, it's pretty good. <laughs> but I still love, I mean, I got teary when I told you about someone making soup for me when I was sick. <laughs> it's, like, it's still yummy. <laughs> So if we hold that as a as another way, another healthy way of being an adult, I think that just broadens, you know, broadens the the, the way to support. It doesn't mean that we're always. And I was talking with the the woman from Japan who sent me this, who told me to read this book, and she said, you know, you can have too much app, right? Mm -hmm. Or you're just kind of dependent all the time. Right. And that's not functional. Yeah, I was wondering about that. Yeah, mm -hmm. there can be too much or not enough. Mm -hmm. It's really about the right place. But but that it's a normal, just like independence mm -hmm. is healthy. Like, you know, a kid learning to tie their shoe, me tying my kid's shoe to be 60, it's probably not the best thing. Yeah. But at times, when I can tie his shoe, he can feel loved mm -hmm. and connected. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That might be a good reason to sometimes not, you know, not expect it to be independent and to sometimes move forward with mm -hmm. Yeah, because there's this also this idea that like, if if you uh, indulge uh, a bad be a bad behavior, that it's gonna that behavior will become ingrained and we're not helping them. Right. And so I think there's a fine line too between our culture and then also uh, seeing it from a different perspective. Of, you know, actually indulging once in a while is is a, is a kind act. Um, That's right. And if someone has an underdeveloped safe and secure system, not indulging that doesn't necessarily help. Mm -hmm. If they don't actually have the capacity they need to settle themselves, mm -hmm. saying, well, you should be able to settle yourself doesn't actually help. Mm -hmm. So what we think is, oh, if I make, if I put the demand on them, they'll be able to do it. Right. Well, if they can't do it, they can't do it. Right. So then we can see the intervention from another place, which is, what can I do that will actually help support developing those moral pathways so they then can be able to settle mm -hmm. So it's not an either or, but, but then it becomes, how do I then interact with you? So that it doesn't become just, you know, you get indulged and it doesn't help, right. or you don't get indulged and it doesn't help. Right. How can I be indulging in a way that is helpful? Right. 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 Which I think, I mean, I don't have the answers all for that, but I think mm -hmm. it's a really interesting question to hold. Definitely. <laughs> now, does this, those little red things mean there's another question? We, we have some questions in the Q&A section. Actually, uh, uh, everyone, it's it's a bit more helpful to put in the chat box because we can answer directly to you or um, share the questions uh, with Dee according to what the question's about. But uh, yeah, we've got a, a comment. Uh, thank you for your time and your words. Um, someone has to, to step out, uh, but uh, that's fine, no worries. 
Uh, but yeah, most of our, our, our questions and comments were in the chat box, and um, there aren't any new ones at the, at the moment. Okay. okay. So um, if you're interested in this concept, um, I'm trying to think where. You're earlier up, there is the citation for Cathay Dow's book. Mm -hmm. um, I can't remember the name right now. Something about interdependence, I think. I think it's got Emily in the title. Um, but there's another lovely book called The Good Shoe Food by a woman named Tracy Slater. And she's an American woman who fell in love with a Japanese man. And she doesn't use the word ame, but she definitely talks about this, this, the feeling of ame, which is why she married a man who she didn't speak his language and moved across, ultimately ended up moving across the world to live with him. Mm -hmm. um, and she talks about the wrestle between um, the fierce sense of independence that she has always had and the, um, the desire for Ame and how, uh, she, I mean, she doesn't name it that way, but I, you know, as I read the book, I'm like, this is what they're talking about, and how satisfying it is for her to have that family relationship with him. Mm -hmm. and, and how it's built for her something that she never had. So it's just, it's a lovely read if mm -hmm. you're interested. Wonderful. Yeah. And we're getting close to the end. So, so as we leave this, as you can tell, I don't have any big answers yet, or maybe ever. <laughs> but my invitation is for you to think about, you know, do you have people in your life you can add in your life? Who are those people? And, and, you know, to kind of sit with that a little bit and mind the sweetness of And I want you to consider how often you might interpret ame behavior in yourself, in your family, or in the people you work with, in a negative way. Where it might you have this more Western perspective as opposed to this more um, collectivist and Japanese concept. But I don't think I don't think it's limited to Japan where people value that. I just think they happen to have this really great word. That's the word I found. And if you saw this AMI behavior as a desire to be connected, as an attempt to repair attachment and build safe and secure brain pathways, and as either a healthy dependence or an attempt at healthy dependence, would it change the way you treat yourself? Or others. And that's for me, if people want to respond, if they have things to say, or you can just wander around holding those questions or forget about them, <laughs> think about your life. But to me, that's sort of what I'm, I'm left sitting on. And that. <laughs> Thank you. Look at the time. Amazing. <laughs> well, we still have a few minutes, if you like. I promised a, a, an additional 15 minutes, if uh, if that's okay with you, Dee, and people have Absolutely. additional questions or responses to the, this uh, this invitation to reflect. Uh, we welcome your your stories and your your uh, comments and questions. Uh, so I'll I'll give you guys a moment to uh, type some stuff up, if you like. Um, yeah. Oh, this was a, a wonderful presentation. Really, I, I really enjoyed this and the teary eyedness happened <laughs> a couple times. It's like, it would be a good day if I don't get a little teary. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's when like, things hit home and you're like, oh, this really resonates. This is a really beautiful and very useful set of ideas here, and uh, I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. and it's just fascinating to me that there are places in the world where this is just the norm. Yeah. Right? Or this is just the underlying way that people work. Right. And live and interact. But they can also name it. And, yes. and that's beautiful. So they, they can they can 
name it and 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 acknowledge it as well, even though it's it's not taken for granted either. It sounds like. Yeah. 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 I I also was so go ahead. No, go ahead. I was also reflecting on how how uh, it sounds close to the Latin, uh, the root for love, in Latin. Um, it, I found that interesting. It's like is it the vibrations of those words both reflect love. Uh, you know, in, uh, in in French is amour and uh, uh, amor in Spanish, and and so that that root. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's really interesting. Yeah. In me, yeah. to love is, is, is almost the same word in French. Yeah. yeah. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> so here's some, uh, oh, just thank yous, thank yous, and, uh, you know, appreciations, and this is very important information, and miigwech for the time and the education. It's gratitudes. Beautiful. Yeah. My pleasure. <laughs> and if you have thoughts, please feel free to... If after those thoughts or reflections, I can, you know, this is the start for me of a reflection on these whole concepts. So if there's uh -huh. something you want to share with me, I'd love, I'd love to hear. Wonderful. Well, we'd love to invite you back to hear, you know, how, how your <laughs> ideas on this develop because this is this is great. You know, this is a uh, uh, some research and uh, theorizing in the making, and that's uh, really exciting. It has direct applications to uh, a, 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 a holistic. Uh, type of approach and uh, yeah, it's wonderful. Thanks so much. Oh, there's a Q&A one. Let me see. Let me just see what's happening here. Uh, a wonderful way to conceptualize the need to feed each other's spirits. Yes, well said. Yeah. So yes, gratitudes. So, thank you so much, Dee. <laughs> <laughs> it was fun. Yes. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Uh, so we'll, we'll um, just say letting everyone know, you know, those of you who had uh, a bit uh, of sound issues, it wasn't everyone, but, uh, but a, a couple of you came forward and said you were having a hard time hearing. I did notice, Dee, that uh, the video stabilized a lot in the second half and the sound was much cleaner. Uh, but we will have the video available and uh, anyone who registered uh, will, will receive a link to the, the video uh, shortly um, in two weeks or less. Uh, and uh, we will That's also really to know. not five minutes. Or less. Yeah, not in the next five <laughs> minutes. But <laughs> <laughs> and, and uh, it will also be at that point uh, posted on on YouTube, so you could share with people who hadn't registered and whatnot. So, so uh, yeah, I really wanted to to thank you, Dee. This was a very enjoyable session, and I want to thank everyone who participated and for the wonderful comments. Uh, and uh, this was the first time we we uh, we got to to uh, bring in someone. Uh, with voice, uh, that was a great suggestion. Thank you, Kyle, for sharing your story. That was that was a wonderful addition. And uh, I want to uh, also thank the whole UBCLC team, Davina Ridley, Javier Rivera, and uh, uh, our IT uh, support, Stefan Mladenovic, and uh, also the First Nations Health Authority for funding this great program and allowing us to share this knowledge with everyone. Uh, this wraps up our sessions for the season. Uh, thanks so much, Dee, for honoring us with the, this last session for us uh, yeah and uh, I want to ask everyone to please keep an eye out for um, our newsletter and check our website for information on our exciting sessions in the spring so thanks so much everyone and now uh, happy you. holidays <laughs> all right thank you bye bye